Hey, man, you guys know I'm in London, right? Yeah, we heard. Yeah. Yeah. Did you hear about the uh, the little bomb scare we had? I did, but I didn't see it in the major news outlets. I, I heard it wasn't a little bomb scare. It was a big one. Well, it was a big scare, but it, there was no bomb, apparently. Um, they found a suspicious vehicle, and uh, they did a controlled detonation. Two of them, actually. It's funny. Everybody got out of the building, and I'm at the Queen Elizabeth Center, which is right next to Westminster Abbey. Both of those buildings were cleared, wow. and they pushed us off to the street. They were like, you know, this isn't your average fire drill. Go to the street. And, you know, so I just I was like, all right, well, this doesn't sound good. I'm just going to start walking away. And so another American came up to me and said, hey, do you know what the event is? And I said, yeah, bomb scare. <laughs> <laughs> and his wife says, let's get the fuck out of here. <laughs> I said, I'm with you. Uh-huh. <laughs> So what's new, guys? More hacky stuff. More hacky yeah, stuff. Always fun. Always good stuff. Uh, some of our sources are Twitter now, so we're getting bleeding edge, I guess. <laughs> oh, yeah. Bleeding edge. <laughs> you know. A lot of the Twitter resources actually go back to, you know, real articles. But um, So what are we starting with, guys? Uh, you know what? I think we start with the probably the most important story this week is the F5 story. F5. F5. Okay. Big IP. Yep. All right. um, so for those of you who uh, are just home users and, and aren't running massive IT shops at work, um, F5 will be not something you need to worry about. Um, however, what, everyone doesn't have one at home. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> this is major uh, network hardware. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. So and it's it's. It's interesting because the flaw in this particular device, this is uh, F5's big IP vulnerability, um, their big IP devices. So the flaw in the device distills down to if you have your management port open to the internet, so the port that an administrator would connect to to make changes to these devices, if that is open to the internet, yeah. then right now there is an unauthenticated RCE. So and I think I found about- a problem right there. You shouldn't <laughs> have management interfaces open to the internet. That is a big major fail. That's probably not a good idea. It's a very bad idea. That is a terrible idea. Yeah. Now this one has a little bit of a twist. Um, now there are um, there are patches out there and that sort of stuff. However, the biggest patch would be go configure your your big IP device to not actually be on the internet. Um, is probably the best thing for your right. management port not to be there. Um, it's so what's interesting about this exploit is there's, there's a couple different campaigns going on right now. One campaign is to go and install, uh, either reverse shells or web shells on the back end. So for those of you who may be new to this show, um, so a remote code executioner is is an RCE. That's what we're talking about where you can run any code you want. Right. Um, and there's two camps. There's the, I want to own this site and, and hold on to it forever and use it for some nefarious reason. And, and to do that, you'll typically in, install a shell. And a shell is just, it's a remote access tool kind of thing, like a rat, um, where I can either have the device call out to me and I have control over it, or I can have that device call out to some command and control structure, what's known as a C2, and then I can control that device and, and then tell it to do things. Right, so that's one camp. So just to calm everybody who doesn't know what you're talking about, if you don't have an F5 device in your organization, you don't have to worry about it, right? It's yeah. a lesson, but it's not. Yeah. it doesn't bear to you. Yeah. Right, right. And it's a, and it's a good lesson. So the, the, the moral of the story is make sure that all of your network devices, whether it's firewalls, routers, switches, or whatever, um, those management ports that you would use as an administrator to configure them should never be on the internet. Right. You shouldn't uh, have access from your iPhone's web browser, no. especially your iPhone's web browser. The, the, <laughs> the three requirements for you to be vulnerable to this is to have the device, which most Small organizations and individuals wouldn't have. Yeah. The next would be to have put your management interface on the internet, which is a bad move in itself, mm-hmm. and to have not patched because there is a patch for this. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And so 
there's a couple things that are wrong here if you have if you're getting exploited by this. Now, the two things that may happen to you, like I said, first camp, somebody may control the device and use it for some nefarious means. Right. The second camp, which has actually been sort of spreading around the internet like wildfire, um, is there's one group out there that is running the rm space dash rf space forward slash star command it just guess rolls that, off the tongue doesn't it right and you want to guess what that does nothing good I, I don't know but anything with star means everything right <laughs> yeah so rm is the remove command oh it deletes all the files it's dash purge. rf is recursive force and then slash star means start at the root so right yeah. now, you're, uh, Kevin Beaumont, one of the guys I actually follow on Twitter, has a lot of really good security research stuff, um, has noticed that using Shodan, so we've talked about Shodan in the past. Shodan is, a, think of it as an IoT Google where mm-hmm. you can go out and find devices. He's noticed massive swaths of F5s that Shodan used to know were out there are now gone. Um, yeah. And, and a, lot of it is, a lot of it seems like um, they've, they've probably been actually formatted. Wow. All right. So Linux is one of those great operating systems. It's not, you know, Windows locks certain files. And when you go to delete everything from the root drive, it's like, hey, hey, no, you can't do this. Yeah. Are you Um, sure? (laughs) Right. And (laughs) Linux is like, hey, we're not locking anything. Go ahead. Let's just remove all of it because you told me. Let's do it. Yeah, let's do it. So I'd like to instruct everybody to put their iPhone up to their speaker right now. Ready? Hey, Siri, do a hard reset of my iPhone. (laughs) Uh, mine is actually responding here, but it says, I'm sorry. <laughs> like, it says, I'm sorry. <laughs> Alexa, order cat food. You know, I am in the UK and they are very polite here. So it would be very much like Siri to say, um, sorry. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I thought that was Canada. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, they, they're, they're even more polite, I think. But they, it, would, it would say, sorry. Mm. So another lesson here, and that, that's what we're all about is the lessons, Right, is most people don't back up the configuration of these things because they think they're immutable. They, they're they not used to them getting formatted. Um, and it's it's a good practice in any case, but um, people could lose their jobs over this if they don't have a backup of these configurations because the network's going to be down. Yeah. Hmm. Now, if you have a restore capability, well, then it's 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 bad, but it's not as bad. You have uh, to but, have restored it in order for it to be reliable. Yeah, you tell the boss, "Hey, we had a network outage, but I fixed it." That's a much better line than we have a network outage, and I don't have any idea when I'll be able to get it back up. Ugh. So Azure is in the news, isn't it? Microsoft oh, Azure. Yeah. yeah, it is. Um, now, so have you have you guys used Azure Synapse and Azure Data Factory pipelines? I'll, I'll admit, I personally have not. My customers have, but I personally haven't. Um, it sounds really cool. Um, you know, what's funny is a lot of really cool technology. I I generally find out about it when it's exploitable and I can break it. And yeah. then I go, oh, cool. Let me take a look at this really neat thing that's existed for a while. It's awesome. Um, awesome. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny i visited a customer this week who listens to the podcast and he's like every time i hear you say oh this is so awesome i get, get i get scared. concerned i get concerned yeah. concerned for his genetic yeah. line he's, he said there's you know he said there's uh there's it's he said if it's a geopolitical thing i hear i hear patrick say let's just nuke him and, <laughs> yes. and if it's a if it's a disaster on the internet i hear Dwayne say that's awesome. So awesome. <laughs> and he's like, Carl then, you know, keeps it kind of even keel. Yeah. I just, just I'm, I'm clueless most of the time. <laughs> yeah. So this vulnerability has already been patched and because it's a cloud vendor and there's been no evidence of exploitation, um, it's probably not as not an event, so, but it's not as serious. So what does it do and who found it? Yeah, so the, the way what this does is if you're leveraging Azure Synapse or a, an Azure Data Factory pipelines. So for those of you who those are new words, which they were for me, um, all that is is analytic services by Azure that give you the ability to analyze large data, sums of data, right? Yeah. So big data warehousing analytics. Right. That's pretty much it. Um, and And the attack here is not that if you're running it, you were going to be compromised from the outside. It's It was that um, a researchers found that if they were using the APIs, 
they could go laterally from customer to customer. So they could pull other customers' data. Wow. If they were using the APIs. And that that was the big issue. Um, so it wasn't really like, a, oh my gosh, anybody on the internet could run this you know, super simple coding. Game this game is a, a good opportunity to teach the listeners what we mean by multi-tenancy. Mm. Yep. <laughs> multi-tenancy. Imagine you have, um, in the old days, you had a computer server and you had all of your stuff within that server for your company and everything's good. And then somebody says, hey, we ought to go to this automated, you know, hosting provider where we can bring our computer and then they can, you know, have it there. And then the the company decides to also host another company's website on your computer. Maybe they asked you, maybe they didn't, but, you know, this happens. You're sharing, you're sharing a computer with somebody else. And you might even be sharing a database with somebody else or services. And that database needs to know the difference between company A and company B. And that's called a tenant. So, you know, you're, you're essentially one password away uh, on the same connection from accessing someone else's data. Imagine a hotel where you have individual bathrooms in each room versus a hotel where all the bathrooms are communal and it's, <laughs> it's just a crapshoot. I laugh, <laughs> but, bad, bad I laugh but most the hostels work that way. Yeah, mm. Communal yeah, bathrooms and bedrooms. That, that's why rich people don't stay in them. Wow. Wow. Usually things don't go wrong. Patrick's the 1%, by the way. Just yeah, let, no, I'm letting everybody know. <laughs> well, maybe, maybe when we talk about my Ukraine story, we will find out that's true. Um, so, but, but it's, you know, usually nothing goes wrong, but yeah. when those tenancy walls are not thick, when, when they're not secured, that's when uh, the neighbor's decisions start to impact you. So the cloud is based on multi-tenancy. And they spend a lot of their time and effort making sure those walls are thick and nice. This is an example where one of the walls was too thin. I have a story. Um, this is this is all teaching day right here. So this was a story from the 90s, I think maybe 94, 95, when uh, I had an NT, a Windows NT server running my application. And I had a customer that wanted some space on it to do some stuff. And, you know, we had a little agreement and they said, I said, okay, it was a, uh, you know, like a survey kind of thing. And so they did this survey. And then like one day my computer is down, like my websites are down, everything's down. And I have no idea why. And the, the ISP looks into it and says, dude, your CPU is maxed. And I looked in, uh, we looked and saw that this tenant had a website that was printing a report in a tight loop, which means not allowing for any other Oof. threads or any other execution on that whole computer while it spits out this report. And, you know, applications these days uh, and programmers know better than to do that. And the, the software won't even allow them to do that. Right. But basically this guy's, uh, what, well, I'm just running a report, you know, <laughs> to, to pr brought down the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds like a denial of service report. I like it. Denial of service report. <laughs> That's really. So it, it doesn't take a big fly. I was on a client <laughs> site, uh, an insurance company out in Western Mass once, and they had a report that every time they were running it, it was corrupting the database of a new system they were bringing online for 100 users. And the, the vendor's like, you can't run that report. It's corrupting the database. And the vendor, the, the customer's like, That's not possible. And so I found out they were doing a report of, uh, between a three million row table and a six million row table mm. with no indexes, and so they were getting table locks for minutes, and it was causing the uh, the data entry system to to be corrupted because it couldn't com complete wow. transactions. So these things happen. They don't happen as much as as you pointed out, Carl. But they still you can still engineer your way into a mess. I think that we ought to call the show "Know Thy Neighbor" yeah. or <laughs> "Beware Thy Neighbor," perhaps. That's right. Um, all the all the stories so far, including this next one, seem to be, you know, um, picking stuff up for your neighbor that wasn't intended for you, or maybe it was and you didn't know it. Yeah. Let's talk about the the historic hotel stay. Historic hotels. Complimentary so emotet exposure included. 
<laughs> Emotet um, does not sound good. He's Emotet's not. bad. Emotet's bad. So, you know, one of the prongs of attacking a company is obviously we're always looking for, for you know, bad code that we can exploit and do something. But the the biggest issue with most companies, the the biggest flaw in the system is usually the humans. Yeah. So we want to get the humans to do things we whatever we want them to do, whether it's click on something, run something, give us some information. And what better way to put together a, a human campaign? We talk about phishing, right? You send an email to someone, hopefully it's convincing. And a lot of us have gotten really good at picking up these phishing emails like, oh, this came from, you know, it's a UPS. Hey, you have this uh, UPS slip and you look at the top and it's from, you know, john at gmail.com. You're like, okay, why would someone at Gmail be sending me this UPS slip? This right. Um, in this particular case, what attackers are now starting to do and, and whether it's from prior breaches, etc., they've found out what hotels you might have stayed at in the past. Wow. And then they send you information actually spoofing the domains of those hotels. Whoa. So you'll see it looks like it's, you know, reservations at Hotel Warner, when in reality the deep dark domain in the background is something entirely different. It's funny because I'm actually doing this show in London at my hotel. And, then, and now I'm just, uh, well, I haven't had any problems yet. But, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it, and it's tough. I mean, if you're not, if you're not used, if you receive an email from a hotel you've actually stayed at mm. and it looks legit, the email address looks pretty clean. You know, most of us aren't going to right click on that email and say view source and try and read through it to make right. sure it's something I shouldn't be clicking on. Right. Actually, I call the hotel. Yeah, I would too. I, I don't I don't interact with email anymore. I've I've known you too long, Dwayne. Um, but but here's Damn here's it, the thing. Foiled. What they're liable to do is send you something that's going to prompt you to be urgent. Like there was damage to the hotel room in your last stay, and we've come up with an itemized bill for for mm-hmm. repairs. Please right. please look at the uh, the attachment. You know, and people would be pissed at that, and they click on it, and now they're owned. Yeah. So you gotta you gotta follow up and say. You know, okay. Even if it's a hot topic, even if it's th- something that makes me upset and nervous, check with the the source to make sure it's legit right. first. Yeah, right. It's like it's like receiving an email about your credit card. Always call the number on the back of the credit card. Don't respond right. to the email. Don't click on a link. I had a, don't call the number in the email. I told you. I told you about yeah. that, right? Yeah, the Big. American Express card. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I wasn't going to use their name, but yeah. <laughs> 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 You no, can go back right. four it's shows right. and you'll hear the story. <laughs> they deserve it. They, it was true. It's a true story. All right. Well, anyway. Huh. Uh, so what's next? Uh, so next on the list, I think, is probably, sadly, uh, a U.S. college is shutting down for good following oh, a yeah. ransomware attack. Yeah. So Lincoln College uh, in – do, 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 where is Lincoln? Illinois. Anybody? Anybody? Here Illinois. You go. Illinois. Um, Isn't a sh- that's a shocker? A shocker right. that they would name a college after Lincoln in Illinois. Right? <laughs> Makes no sense. Sadly enough, COVID hit them pretty hard. Um, I think COVID hit a lot of colleges pretty hard. Yeah. Um, actually, I, I don't know if you guys have. I have college age and kids who are almost college age looking to apply to colleges. So my youngest what, daughter is a sophomore, and she you know. completely lost her senior year at school. And yep. her, her first year at college was a boondoggle. Yep. Same thing with my, uh, my. I'm sure they gave her a big discount, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no, they did not, Patrick. No. <laughs> Shall I call out the college? <laughs> it's up to you. It doesn't matter. It's all of them. I think that's, all that of describes them. all of them. Right. I don't think anybody said, uh, we're going to lower our fees. No. No, and what's what's been tough for kids is um like if they're applying this year, a lot of kids took a gap year because of COVID. Right. So a lot of the colleges now have massive uh, you know, influx of of applications. So if you were trying to apply for a college this year, um, you know, there are some schools who receive ten, fifteen thousand apps that now are at seventy, eighty thousand applications for next wow. year. Um wow. So, yeah, it's definitely made things harder for kids to get into school. So it's sad that one of these colleges has shut down. So in this particular case, COVID hit them hard. 
which COVID hit everybody hard. I get right. that. Um, but then on top of that, they had a ransomware attack that shut them down for months and they just couldn't recover. Um, they decided they, they filed with the board of education saying, you know what, we're never going to open the doors again. Wow. That's horrible. Yeah. Which is, you know, the, I t- I'd say take this as a cautionary tale, right? Mm-hmm. Um, ransomware doesn't care what industry you're in ransomware doesn't care how big your organization is ransomware doesn't even care how much money you make um, as an organization ransomware Ransomware is the honey badger (laughs) (laughs) oh man there's a that's a blast from the past I like to date myself since no one else will date me. <laughs> that was a that was a serious internet meme, and I'm thinking it was like in the 2000s, 90s. wasn't it? Oh, yeah, yeah, it probably was early 2000s. I'm not as old as you guys. You're gonna have to explain this, honey. It's badger. a honey badger, which is just ex- ex- an extremely ferocious thing. That when it's backed into a corner, it doesn't matter what the threat to it is, it's coming out Lions. swinging. Doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and there was a guy um, who did a meme and he narrated a, a video of a honey badger. It was like one of the first video memes that I ever saw. And he's like, honey badger don't care. And, and that was <laughs> like the whole thing was <laughs> him saying that. That's awesome. <laughs> well, there you have it. Ransomware, the honey badger. Um, it doesn't care. All right. Let's talk about Iran. I actually, I think this one's pretty awesome. Not from the, um, not You're not a fan of Iran, I hope. No, I'm not at all, actually. But um, though I'm I sure they're wonderful people. <laughs> I actually know some Iranian people that are. I really do too. Iranian it's the, people it's the are, government. Are, are wonderful people. They yeah. are. Yeah, and you know, all things said on this podcast, I will say I I, I have gr- access to grind against governments, but never the people. You know, it's funny. Our our friend Tim Huckabee. He's he's yeah. always saying. You know, I have no problem with the Canadian government. It's the people I don't like. <laughs> How can he not like the people? They're so no. Nice. It was always a, just a running joke. <laughs> it was a running he, he, joke. Some of his best friends were from the Microsoft Regional Director Program, which Rick Carl and I were both members of yeah. for a long time. Yeah, and uh, he would make jokes uh, to with his friends from Canada, and he would talk about you know, all sorts of things, but he would, he would take the Mickey out of them every chance he got. Yeah. All right. So Iranian hackers exposed in a highly targeted espionage campaign. What happened? This sort of spy craft is not new, right? Um, there's always some advanced persistent threat team. I can't remember who these, these guys are. APT 34. For those of you marking off your bingo cards, that's what we should have. <laughs> APT bingo cards. And as we mentioned, oil rig mark, mark, acronym bingo, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oil rig is their nickname. Yeah. Okay. So a- APT 34 oil rig, um, who targeted Jordanian diplomats, um, wow. just getting them to click on things. And, they, and they, here again, this is a targeted spear phishing attempt. So phishing, phishing is sending massive amounts of emails out there trying to get somebody to click on something malicious. Right. Spear phishing is what it sounds like. I'm picking a particular group or a particular person, right? I'm targeted. I'm looking for one group. So this is right. a spear phishing campaign as opposed to a whaling campaign, <laughs> Which is I'm looking for high value targets in an organization. Um, so what about a trawling people. campaign? That's, <laughs> that's, pretty a no, much that's a, just a phishing campaign. <laughs> phishing campaigns are mass mass emails, and that's just using nets. Uh, Big net. <laughs> what about a lobster trap campaign? Entirely different. Those are only conducted in the Northeast. <laughs> <laughs> so what's interesting about this is it. Here again, just an email coming and someone clicks on something that does something malicious. What right. I found interesting about this article, though, is it, it talked about, A, um, it, this is an Excel macro, yet again. Um, so oh. interesting enough that people are still allowing macros to run in the background. And I know Microsoft's looking to shut that down and not allow macros to run, but that also assumes that you're updating your systems constantly. Um. But the other interesting thing is this is this ends up being a .NET um, application that gets dropped, um, and they do some interesting things to subvert antivirus and subvert endpoint protection. One of the things they do is as soon as the application is run, it mm-hmm. actually sleeps for eight hours, waiting for the system to be unattended before it does anything. Wow. Um, now, this is good for a couple different reasons. One, well, actually, hacker advice here. 
Listen, <laughs> AP234. <laughs> First off, if you're using the sleep command, that's not going to bypass sandboxes. Um, so if, for example, your code were picked up by Defender and Microsoft runs it in their sandbox in the cloud, um, they bypass all sleep. So you're going to want to make sure you use something other than sleep. We actually have special algorithms we use that slow our code down. Stop teaching the Iranian spies, please. <laughs> yes, Dwayne. <In> fact, <laughs> okay. No hacker advice for you. No hacker advice. <laughs> uh, so, no you know, you. so they do they do a sleep uh, for eight hours, and then when the system is unattended, they actually their communication chain back to their command and control structure or their yeah. C two is via DNS. Um, and we were actually we were able to use this on a recent campaign of ours, which is really kind of neat. So to unpack that a little bit, what's DNS? Hacking. Domain name system. Oh, there That's you go. Right. Domain name Very system. Good. So yeah. all DNS does is resolve a name, www.microsoft.com, to mm-hmm. an IP address because your browser needs to communicate with IPs. Right. That's how, how the internet works. Um, so what's what's interesting about DNS infill and exfil, uh, infiltration of data or exfiltration of data, is that what you do is you make a query to your domain. Let's call it hacker.com. Um, And instead of looking for www.hacker.com, I look for, you know, R-A-Z-U-P-G-2-W-0-1-E-O-S.hacker.com. Now, what is that? That's just a base64 string. So it's it's a string that is encoded. Um, So base64, for those of you, I know I'm throwing out a lot of sort of... It's, It's like pig Latin for computers. Yeah. Patrick, I love your analogies. That is perfect. <laughs> it's Ig Latin pay for or um, um, computers K. <laughs> it is. It is. So you'll send this string. It's not encrypted, but if you look at it, it looks encrypted. But it, yeah. um, when you base 64 a string, it takes all special characters, like space is a special character. Um, you know, percent is a special character. It'll take all those special characters and, and it guarantees that you're going to have a, one solid string that's always in the range of, you know, lowercase a to lowercase z, uh, mm. zero to nine with no special characters, which is nice because then you can bring it back to all the special characters before uh, later on. So when I query this debate, you know, the R-A-Z-U-P-G-N whatever dot hacker dot com, my DNS server, my, my malicious server receives that request. Mm-hmm. And instead of looking for what the IP address is of that server, it actually takes the name and decodes it out of base64 back into a regular string and says, oh, okay, you just ran the who am I command. Great. Now tell me uh, who's the person who, who, what's the privileges that user has? Holy crap. When I, when I return my result to you, I give you a fake IP address, but then in what's called the text record, I ask you to run another command and you then grab down the IP and the text record and you run another command and you break it out into another, you know, four or 5,000 host names that are base 64 with the result. This reminds me of like a sub conversation that goes on like kids. They have, you know, when kids figure out that they can make up languages and protocols and stuff that their parents won't understand. Mm -hmm. Or if you're, you know, if you're playing bridge with your, your friends and, you know, your 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 partner and you have a have a thing going on, and then the other guys have a thing going on. One of the partners says, uh, "You remember that uh, jewelry store we used to go to down downtown? Yeah, they had a lot of diamonds down there. Uh, <laughs> how many diamonds do you think they had? Well, I don't know, yeah. four. You know." <laughs> <laughs> First off, Carl, I know how old you are. You're not old enough to play bridge. But secondly, you are right. Um, so it's very it's very similar to that. It's is, a it's a meta conversation. It's it's using mm-hmm. DNS, which was never meant to be some sort of you know client server gateway for anything other than doing what it does, yeah. and it's repurposing it. Yeah, and what's what's interesting That's is there's a awesome. lot. Can, there's a lot. It's so awesome. There's a lot <laughs> you can do here. Uh, I'll give you a, a, a tiny little side story. Um, to just to, to to show how powerful this is, we were pen testing a, a customer, mm-hmm. and they put us on a computer. We had access to one of their computers that was completely shut down from anything. Didn't have access to the internet. Couldn't download any of our tools. It was literally just a jump box to get into systems internally to their network. Um, 
the only, I, I couldn't run anything. I couldn't um, download my own tools. I couldn't open a browser. Um, but what they did leave open was the fact that DNS still worked. It's still authenticated to a domain, right? To authenticate to the domain, you need to find the Active Directory records in the local AD DNS. Right. So we could query the domain controller. So the, the domain controller, for those of you who don't manage massive Active Directory Windows environments, a domain controller is you in Windows, you have a domain. It's a place that holds all of your accounts and resources like computers and printers. Right. And you can, and that domain controller typically is running a domain naming service. So you know where the resources are. I want to authenticate. Where's the authentication server? Right. Right. I want to, I need a printer. Where's the printer? It's uh, something that we desperately need in home uh, networks behind firewalls where we have multiple computers and printers and we don't have names for them. Right. Yeah, exactly. Um, so what's interesting is we're pen testing and we needed tools. We needed to pull down our tools. Mm -hmm. We're like, oh, we can't pull down our tools. We can't copy anything up here. This, this box doesn't even have access to the internet, really. Um, but what we were able to do was write our own utility that would query our domain controller out in Azure. And we would take an executable. Let's say, for example, it's calculator. We take calculator, calc.exe. And we would encode every bit of calc.exe in base64. So we it didn't it, have the same signature. Not uh, even so that it didn't have the same signature, but so that we would have like 15,000 20 character strings. Oh, that's funny. And we would then make those, we'd say, he'd say, hey, I'm looking for, you know, file number one. And it would say, oh, file number one.hacker.com, here's the string. And it would give me the string. And it would give me all these thousands of strings. And then I took those strings and reassembled them back down to an executable and could run it. So you could. That sounds like you. Pull all the tools directly over DNS through this person's domain domain controller to then run those tools. And yeah, it was, it's pretty awesome. So that, that similar awesome. technique is being, <laughs> it's being used for communications back and forth. All so. right. So how do we know in our companies that, uh, our DNS servers can't be used for such nefarious purposes? Ah, uh, that is a good question. Mm -hmm. Um, so the first thing you should look for is if you ever see 15,000 DNS requests coming from one computer, there's something wrong there. Yeah, it's yeah. basic. It, there's never, you're going to see a few, maybe a hundred DNS requests in an hour ish hmm. from a, from any computer on your network. Any more than that, you're, you probably so have an issue. If, if you have a sophisticated and good um, intrusion detection system, IDS, it, it should pick that up, but they don't all. Hmm. I believe that the client you were talking about might have had an IDS on site at the time, didn't they? Yeah. Uh, yes. yes. So, so it doesn't always get through. That. But then the other side is if it's an APT, an advanced persistent threat, they can do 50 a day. Wow. Yeah. It'll take months. It'll take are, 18 are you months. more hacker advice? Slow down your request. It's going to be harder to find. Use <laughs> oh a better speed mechanism to avoid the sandbox. All right, but if we're going to give them a tip, we have to come up with an antidote. I mean, what's the <laughs> antidote to that? IDS and, and, and maybe you should learn how to read packets and take a look sam at samples occasionally. Mm. Yeah. And if you, and if you're ever doing any logging, I know a lot of companies don't do this, but if you're ever doing logging of X of your, anything that's going from inside of the network to the outside, mm -hmm. even if you were to do something simple, like show me what the top domains that every computer in the organization queried today. Okay. Yeah. Right. It, it might be Microsoft.com. It might be, you know, our vendor, maybe we deal with the New York stock exchange or whatever. Right. And then if you see hacker.com as like number three. You go, well, okay, okay. That's it's probably great. not going to be hacker.com. It's probably no, going but to be. It will be an unknown. It will be something domain. that doesn't, right. it's, it'll be something that shouldn't be above, you know, a news organization.com. No. It should, it would be something like, you know, IOT box, raspberry Pi dash Dwayne's yes. house. Yeah. Number one. Exactly. Yeah. Now, com. Not to, not to rain on that parade, but. Um, typically what we'll do is register about a hundred different domains and then we'll, oh, we'll here have, we go. We'll More career criminal up. advice. We'll okay. split every so as soon as we give a tip, Dwayne's there it's with a, a way to get around it's it. A combat, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's it's an arms race. It is an yes. arms race. There is, there's a move against every move. But what I will say okay, is but this. What's the final protection though? Don't 
get owned in the first place. Don't <laughs> let him on your system. Because in the case in, in the scenario that we're talking about, he's already on the network. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So somebody had to run something. In this particular case, we were doing a, a red team engagement, so they put us on the network willingly. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So basically that simulates place. okay, so so someone got fished. Yep. And now you're on the network. What could you do once you're inside? And right. so we did a lot. Yeah, and unfortunately, right. it comes down to don't get fished. Yeah. Because you don't, you don't want, want us on the network. All right, Patrick, I know you have the last story here. Uh, I do. And it's near and dear to your heart. Tell us about it. So we have a programmer whose name is being withheld because he's a, he's a great guy, but he's actually um, working uh, to fight the Russians in Ukraine. And mm-hmm. his company is some a group of people who are all from Ukraine and they've been working with us for many years. Uh, we know them very well from business and uh, they've taken the whole company and turned it, pivoted it and put all their resources into supplying the Ukrainian troops with flak vests and, uh, and wound bandages, wow. tourniquet kind of bandages. That's and great. they've, they've just recently set it up so that it is a charity I don't know whether it's the contributions are tax deductible for the contributor, but, um, you know, you can find out that information and the, the URL is hearts.startupsoft.com. And I'd love it if we could put that on the episode. Um, we've just given them $30,000 to buy 150 flak vests. Wow. That's great. Um, and you know, I, I leave it to the U S government and other governments to provide lethal aid, this is non-lethal aid, so it's humanitarian in its aspects, but it does help the war effort. And it's something that I, you know, I'm going to keep trying to contribute to. But if we can spread the word, that'd be great. Yeah, I'm going to contribute as well. That's great, Patrick. Thank you. And thanks, guys. It's been an enlightening, uh, uh, oh, <laughs> cautionary tale show. They all about, are, doesn't it? What yeah. are we going to call this one? Uh, I think Beware Thy Neighbor is a, there you go. That's a, good one. Is a really good one. Yeah. All right. We'll see you next week. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys.